Hello everyone, I am the Lore Explorer, and this is Outer Wilds, an extraordinary exploration game telling the story of a solar system trapped in a time loop. But one of the reasons this game resonated with me so much is how dedicated the developers were to presenting real-world scientific scenarios in interesting ways. Their goal wasn't to force these concepts down your throat and teach you them, they just simply wanted to let you experience them, and so they built a solar system full of the wonders of science. And it turns out, they did a really good job at it. They really went above and beyond with this one. Someone told them the sky's the limit, and their response was, maybe sometimes, but we have spaceships. So in today's loop, I want to highlight the ways the developers tried to depict real-world science, even if they skewed it a bit to make it fit into a 22-minute time loop. And as always, this video will contain spoilers for Outer Wilds. Science has always been one of my passions. As soon as it was introduced to me, I absolutely loved all things space. And as I get a bit older, physics is right up there with it. So to stumble across a game like Outer Wilds, which uses these topics to invent an awesome universe, was just amazing to me. One of the first times this is highlighted is the first time we get our spacesuit. Before we get our launch codes, we can go train with our flight coach, Gossen. But putting on our own suit, a few things pop up on the helmet's visor, which serves as a display. It shows us that the game tracks our oxygen, fuel, and the gravitational forces we are currently under. When we are on the surface of the planet, the gravity meter reads 1G, since these are the gravitational forces we are used to as a Harthian. But a task from Gaussen has us ride an elevator deep under the surface of the planet. The meter, once we get to the bottom, reads 0.4 Gs, and as we slowly descend deeper and deeper into the planet, the gravitational forces slowly get lower and lower as well until finally we reach the center of the planet and our meter hits zero g. This is actually accurate to real world physics. The gravity we feel here on earth is caused by the mass of our planet, and all of its mass is pulling down on us towards the earth's core. But if we were to get underneath some of that mass, there would be less mass underneath pulling us down. There would also be more mass above us pulling us up. And as we finally reach the core of the planet, the mass that makes up the planet would be surrounding us equally, meaning we are being pulled both up, down, left, and right equally, resulting in the zero-g environment we see depicted in the game. In the real world, gravitational effects don't end there. In the Harthian Museum, they have an exhibit focusing on the gravitational effects of the solar system. The display shows us even on the surface of Timber Hearth, its moon, the Outer Rock, still has gravitational sway. The three balls in the base follow the Outer Rock around in its orbit. That's actually what causes the tides here on Earth, as the moon's mass tugs on the closest part of Earth to it, which is usually the oceans. This isn't the only place tidal effects are found in the Outer Wild Solar System. The Hourglass Twins and the Interloper are great examples of this, but we will talk about them later. For now, I want to stick with the Timber Hearth system. A detail I've recently noticed, thanks to a member of the Discord, is the Adder Rock is tidally locked to Timber's Hearth, meaning it takes the same amount of time for it to fully rotate as it does for it to complete one orbit around Timber's Hearth, just like the Moon does with Earth. At any point in its orbit, the same part of the Adder Rock is facing Timber Hearth. This has a pretty awesome effect from the viewpoint of the moon or the outer rock. This means that we can go to the outer rock, find that point that always faces Timber Hearth, and spend the whole loop there standing just staring at Timber Hearth, which is the same thing in real life. You can do that with the moon too. Earth would forever be in the sky, which you can see here in Kerbal Space Program, a pretty accurate spaceflight simulator. Another cool realistic detail about Timber's Hearth is the planet-wide water system. We have lakes and waterfalls scattered all throughout the surface, but the developers didn't just leave it there. All over the planet, we find geysers that reliably erupt. Using real-world logic, we can deduce Timber Hearth has underground waterways, and it is geothermically active. For geysers to occur, water underneath the surface has to heat up and build pressure on the material above it until the water erupts through the crust. And sure enough, if we brave the consequences and dive into a geyser, we find just below each group of geysers are geothermal vents. And here on Earth, this is caused by our molten core. But as we've covered, the core of Timber Hearth is hollow, so these are likely caused by tides and friction of the material of Timber Hearth being shifted around by the sun and close passes to other planets. 
Another really cool feature of the game is how well they've depicted orbital mechanics. Naturally, we find the planets closest to the sun are moving the fastest, and the planets further away are moving slower. The Hourglass Twins has an orbital velocity of 259 meters per second, while Dark Bramble's orbital velocity is only 141 meters per second. And we can see the parallel of this in real life as Mercury moves around the sun at roughly 10 times the orbital speed of Neptune, the last planet in our solar system. Deal with it. But I think the best demonstration of accurate orbital mechanics in the game are the Nomai shuttles. These essentially follow real world spaceflight mechanics. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to do a quick flight in the Kerbal Space Program. Looking at the map of both the Outer Wild Solar System and the Kerbin Solar System, you can see some similarities. The orbital lines in Kerbal are colored, but both represent the same thing. The orbital path that that planet takes around the sun, or the home body. While on the surface of Brittle Hollow, we inherit the orbital speed of that planet, since we are on it, moving along with it around the sun. Similarly, while in orbit around Earth, a spaceship has the same thing, an orbital velocity around Earth. So you can basically just look at a Nomai shuttle as a rocket in orbit around Earth. And in order to get to another planet or moon, you have to do things in a specific way. You can't just point at a planet or moon and fire the rocket and expect to reach it. While in orbit around Earth, if we just aim our rockets at the moon and fire, we may be facing in a way that subtracts from our orbital velocity, which would cause us to end up falling back down to Earth, or in the case of Outer Wilds, falling into the Sun. Instead of that, we need to make sure that we are adding to our orbital velocity, or have otherwise planned for that. But even that isn't enough. Again, if we just aim at a planet and fire, we are going to end up where that planet was, where we pointed the rocket. The problem with that is, the planet is going to move from that point in space by the time we get there, since it also has an orbital path through space. Instead, you have to aim ahead of that planet in its orbit, in a way that lets you meet the planet where it's going to be. I can go into more detail about how spaceflight mechanics are really well done like arrow braking, but it would likely take up a long time in the video, and I really want to talk about black holes. Obviously, the black holes we see in the game are fiction. As far as we know, entering a real black hole wouldn't send you back in time, and it would also sort of turn you into a form of atomic spaghetti. But there are a few things Outer Wilds actually portrays really well with black holes. They sort of go out of their way to let us know that the black holes are just warp space-time, and the visual depiction of them is actually pretty awesome. When you get close to a black hole in real life, there is a certain area surrounding it in which light bends drastically all around the black hole called the event horizon. If we set up a camera just outside or inside that little area, the light gets bent so much you can basically see the back of your head, you can see what's behind you. And the free cam mod in Outer Wilds lets us experience this firsthand. And you can even get close to it with your ship and see a bunch of wibbly wobbly stuff. Another thing that may be hard to believe that's accurate about Brittle Hollow is Brittle Hollow itself. Many people think that with the black hole sitting at its core, the crust should have been consumed by now. But since the mass of the black holes in Outer Wilds don't grow, it's essentially just a dense core of a planet. It'd be like finding an inactive black hole in real life and finding a safe distance in which to orbit it at, then surrounding it with an artificial crust. The crust would just safely orbit the black hole since the mass of the black hole never grows. This would also limit its gravitational pull. That would essentially allow us to orbit the black hole forever. But I think one of the most all-in-one accurate depictions of something in the game is the interloper, an interstellar comet that could almost be pulled right out of a book about eccentric retrograde orbits. We can basically track its course into our solar system, coming in from the direction opposite of the other planets, just barely missing our sun. And after 200,000 years of having close passes to the sun, it's also become tidally locked. But there are a lot of ways the developers tried to depict real world physics with the interloper. As a comet flies through the solar system, it mostly stays frozen. But if it drifts too close to the sun, the ice begins vaporizing, leaving a trail of dust behind it in its wake. And as this happens, the vapor builds up around the comet and forms something called a coma. Particles in the coma become ionized by solar radiation, and this forms a secondary tail of these high-energy particles leading away from the sun. 
and sure enough, if we get to the right angle on the interloper, we can see both of these tails streaming away from their icy home. And studying the comet closer, we see another cool little detail. When the interloper arrived in the solar system, it was likely a perfect sphere of ice. But each time the interloper gets too close to the sun, some of the ice melts. And we can see this process when the interloper gets close to the sun. This freshly melted ice pulls up around the comet. And since the comet is rotating so fast in space, all of that water gets flung and pulls up on the back, forming these awesome long tails over time. It's sort of like throwing a baseball that's covered in rain, which just goes to show you how deeply these developers were thinking about things. Which lets me get to the reason I wanted to make this video in the first place. Despite its obvious fictional nature, the eye of the universe is actually an excuse to show a few real-life physics phenomena. While visiting the sixth location of the quantum moon, we learn from Solonim that time here really doesn't move. She's not sure if it's been 200,000 years or 15 seconds, and while this may seem odd, this may just be a nod towards time dilation. Though gravity isn't all that intense at the eye of the universe's planet, I full-heartedly believe that we are just outside of a quantum black hole, and since time is relative to each observer in the universe depending on a few different factors, for someone inside such an intense gravitational field such as the eye, time would move slower than it would for someone outside of it. For example, someone at Timber Hearth would experience time as what we'd call normal since we are used to it outside of the eye's gravitational field, and say 200,000 Timber Hearth years pass. But to somebody inside the immense gravitational field of the eye, where time is moving slowly, it may only experience a few seconds, or at least be very disorienting to the person in it, which is what we see in the Solomon's fate ending. The most obvious function of the eye of the universe is the one we are told about it. It serves as a cause of all quantum behavior in the universe. And the clever trick here is Solomon tells us that this behavior that we witness is actually abnormal in the rest of the universe, and the behavior only exists at the atomic or particle scale. And to preface, I'm not a quantum physicist, but from my understanding, in real life, atoms seem to exist in a wave-like state, in multiple different places at once until observed, at which time they become an actual atom in a certain location in our universe. But in outer wilds, the closer you get to the eye of the universe, the larger the scale of this gets. Which is why we can see behavior in the form of shards or trees disappearing and reappearing in random locations. These would represent the wave-like multiple locations of the quantum particles. And the truth is, it's a pretty good depiction of quantum behavior in the wave-like state particles and atoms exist in, just scaled up to make it understandable to the player. And I think that's an amazing quality these developers possess. They are able to take complex scientific concepts and boil them down to something digestible in 22 minute bites. The most obvious example of this being the sun of the outer wild solar system. For the first 11 minutes or so, everything seems to be fine with our beloved sun. But we soon find out not all is well with our precious ball of gas. The sun's core has contracted and has run out of hydrogen to burn. It heats up quickly and begins swelling up. The sun starts becoming more active on its surface and it turns a mean red. The red giant phase has now begun. The star begins to fuse heavier elements and continues to expand until eventually it collapses in on itself, causing a massive supernova that engulfs the entire solar system. The developers were able to take a process that is supposed to take millions of years and turned it into a 22 minute event for us to experience. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how most of the other planets make perfect sense as well. On Brittle Hollow, two giant ice caps can be found on its poles, just like our icy north and south pole here on Earth, the moon, Mars, and likely billions of other planets. I'm pretty sure this is due to the equator getting most of the sun on the planet, but another polar phenomenon is happening close by in the outer wild solar system. The gas giant planet Giant's Deep has a massive tornado encircling its entire north pole. But this isn't just a spectacular act of fiction. 
we can see similar things on Saturn and Jupiter due to the different densities and temperatures of the air in the atmosphere. Without getting as much sun, the air on the poles are a bit colder and become denser, and the warmer air is less dense, and the two have a hard time mixing together. A trip on down to the Hourglass Twins may seem like a joke to you. A binary planet system with a giant sand pillar leading from one to the other. And these two planets routinely exchange them back and forth? That's crazy. And we aren't exactly sure why it's so intense. But this sand pillar is just another depiction of tidal effects. The gravity of Ember Twin pulls on the sand closest to it and eventually wins that struggle. And a cold effect of this constant exchange of sand between the two is that the equator of Ember Twin has effectively been hollowed out. After hundreds of thousands of years of this sand exchange, it's slowly worn away at the rock surface of Ember Twin until eventually there's just nothing left more to wear down and we are left with the amazing canyon we see today. As you can see, real life science seemed to be an inspiration for every single planet in the solar system as well as the core mechanics of the game. So in some ways, Outer Wilds is an open love letter to science. Each location tells a story of someone at Mobius Digital who loves comets or orbital mechanics, and it's not like they threw it in your face or even tried to teach you about polar vortex or black hole event horizons. It's just all there for you to discover and appreciate for the sake of appreciating science, whether you know it or not. And I'm just very happy to find a game that uses science scenarios to create a fun playground. If you liked the video, consider subscribing here, and if you like the channel, consider becoming a member. Each membership really does help the channel grow, so a special thank you to the members here on the channel. Your support really does mean the world to me. As always, this is the Lore Explorer, and thanks for watching this far in the video. Aside from memberships, that really is the best way to support a YouTuber, as it lets YouTube know my content is worth watching. So thanks again, and I hope to see you in the next video.